Many years ago, the, uh, there was a, what was it called, the mini DARPA challenge? And it was intended to get people ready for the big DARPA challenge to run a autonomous robot through the desert and not have it you know, kill anybody. And that, uh, so people were saying, well, instead of building a Volkswagen, can I, can I build something in my, in my backyard and try this out? And yes, you can, but the, this, this, the, the localization tools that were available were things like GPS. And GPS, if you don't have the local repeaters and stuff, it, does, it, it, it wanders and stuff. It's great for driving down the road at 70 miles an hour and lets you know if you're within a meter of where you need to be, you're okay. But if you're within a meter of where you need to be in your backyard, you've probably mowed over the, the nasturtiums or something like that. So we needed something that had like inch resolution or half inch resolution. So there was this kind of debate about, well, what, what, how would you do it? And the discussions were, oh, just use, use what you've got. Use infrared uh, sensors. Use, uh, use uh, sonar. Use um, light. Use uh, radios. Or uh, use things that rotate. And, and those things have been done. A lot of localizers use a rotating beacon, and they reflect off of uh, corner reflectors. A corner reflector is, you ever had a contractor put two mirrors next to each other in your bathroom, and you, you th or maybe the contractor didn't you do it. You thought it looked good on, on a, you know, when you drew it, and then you walk in the room and you go, ah, because the, you're looking at yourself all the time when you go in there. And so you realize that corner reflectors reflect back exactly what they see. So you could put corner reflectors in a room and just have a rotating beacon. And if, when you got the hits and knew what angle you were pointing at, you could figure out where you were. But my deal is I wanted to build something that didn't move. And you go, oh, why, are you in a, why are you in a robotics group if you want to build something that doesn't move? It, it, just so I can, you know, just to be different. <laughs> so my idea was use cheap audio speakers and a cheap audio microphone and do it with nothing that moves and still identify where things are. And then, you know, then we went back and forth on that and it says, well, you got to have a sink. You know, you got to know when it started. And I said, well, I don't think so. I think it'd be done completely asynchronously. And I, and I just boldly said, it can be done asynchronously. And I thought, I better prove that. <laughs> so, I, anyway, so that's what I did. Now, it turns out having a sink is very useful, but it's not absolutely necessary. So uh, you're, when I show you this stuff, you're going to go, why did you do it that way? Well, here's my why did you do it that way thing. First of all, I wanted it to be educational. I really cared less whether it worked. I cared more that I understood why it did or didn't work and that it would be educational not only to me but to you and to children. I saw, and one of the things I saw is, is and maybe this is on another slide, but You'd be either at a competition or just the gathering with people around, and there's these big robot, and it would just go bang into the wall. And the kid would say, what did you do that for? It said, well, the, the infrared couldn't detect the dark color of the wall. And how does infrared work? Well, it's invisible light. And the kids are like, yeah, that's why it doesn't work. It's not turned on. <laughs> <laughs> and the same way with the sonar. It, we, the hobbyist sonars run at 40 kilohertz, and the kids are like, and actually kids can hear like 22, 23 kilohertz. As you, very annoying, but I, I'm very jealous of them. But 40 kilohertz is still outside their range, so they're like, I don't think you got it turned on. You know, because World War II sub movies, you the ping, ping, or one more ping, please, facility, you know, what, facility, whatever his name was. You know, so I thought, I want it to be audible. I want people to be able to hear it. And the other issue with being audible is you can debug it, because otherwise you can't see or hear it. You know, people get their digital camera out and see, is my infrared working? You know, we have to have these other tools to debug it. What about using your own ears? So that was one of my goals. That put some huge constraints on it because audible sound has a much wider wavelength and the general wisdom is that you can't uh, localize or identify things that are like a quarter wavelength or within some order of magnitude of the wavelength that you're working with. So 40 kilohertz is used because it's a very narrow, very short wavelength and gives you high resolution. But it's also highly directional. If you're not pointing at what you want to look for, you can't see it. The other thing I proved in a previous presentation was that at those high frequencies, you can't see soft things. Like I put, a, I put just some foam rubber on the wall and pointed a high frequency transducer at it and said, nah, there's nothing there. Cut the frequency down to two kilohertz and says, ah, big obstacle there. So that was the other thing, that robots run into a couch and somebody goes, I guess I had a problem in my code. No, you didn't have a problem in your code. You're using 40 kilohertz. I can't see a couch. <laughs> Unless it's like too close and then you tell the motors to reverse, reverse, crash. 
Anyway, so those are, these are my, my criteria, uh, which you can object to, and then you can design something that has your own criteria. But I want it to be cheap, dirt cheap. You know, the, everything you see up here, you can get at Fry's or Micro Center for $120, except for the computer. All the rest of it, everything up here, except for the projector and the computer, $120, and you got it. Plus, and that's including three $10 cables. It just bugs me that, that audio cables, that it's just a simple audio cable, a dollar a foot, but that's because I can't see what I'm soldering anymore. So, you know, I just go, okay, $10, I'll, I'll buy it instead of burning my fingers off. It, and, and I wanted to use minimum number of parts, even if another beacon would be better, even if a better beacon would be better, even, even if, no, if, you can get, if, if something cheap is available and you can get by one instead of two, try it, because that pushes the limits. It forced me to learn what was really happening, as opposed to, as opposed to fluxing it together and having it maybe work. That's the other thing I saw. Some people do, and, and I'm not trying to, you know, make a general statement here, but it is—it's tempting to. Sorry about that, Glenn. <laughs> it's tempting to uh, buy something, slap it on the uh, the robot, start, you know, downloading libraries and just sort of hack something together and get it to work. Oh, that worked. And, well, it didn't quite work, and I call it flutzing. And I, I wanted to instead to have something where I knew why it worked, and if it didn't work, I would know why it didn't work. And so the code would be deliberate. It would be doing it on purpose. And any error that it had would be something that I could figure out. OK, well, so I've just explained those things. By the way, these slides will be uh, uh, given to DPRG, and, and, and you can uh, download it at, in a PDF form. So you can, there's a lot of words up here. I did that on purpose so that you could read this at a later time and see what was going on. So it is this sonar. This, this locate, so let me back up for a minute. Do we understand what we're trying to accomplish here is to find out where a robot is within an arena. So the robot, this red thing's microphone, is in this arena somewhere. And it has either forgotten where it is or the, the, uh, the integral errors in its odometry and its uh, pit have been, become so uh, great that it does not reliably know where it is. So you want to recalibrate it where it is. And instead of running it into a corner until it can't move anymore, which that'll recalibrate it, uh, maybe you'd like to have it stop and figure out where it is. And that's, that's what we're trying to accomplish here, with using uh, sound beacons to do that. So uh, is this sonar? And the answer is no. Sonar is echolocation. That's where the, the robot, at, with active sonar, the robot is pinging and listening for echoes coming back. And it uses the time of flight to figure out where those echoes were. And typically, you point the sonar at what you want to see, and you get it. And you can map out the environment by rotating the sonar, and you get information about the first and maybe the second uh, target that was in that line. This is not that at all. This is where the environment is pinging, and the robot is listening. And the robot knows. It has some knowledge about the rate at which the pings are occurring and their separation, but it doesn't know when they're going to happen. That's the no sync part. It doesn't know when they're going to arrive. It just knows that they have a particular characteristic about how far apart they should be separated. And uh, in this particular setup, I, I, there's two ways of doing it. One is to, to simulate that. I can have one device providing the output and another device providing the input. And since they're running off different sample clocks, that proves that it'll work without a sync. But as, as I said, for simplicity, here in the demonstration, I have the output and input synchronized together so that, uh, that that speeds things up a little bit. But it works either way. Um, and it is, so it is not triangulation, because with triangulation you have two directional sensors, like the loop antennas or something, that point at a radio source or the sound source. And you have another, and you either you say, you remember where that is, and then you point and say, oh, I found another one. And you know where those terrestrial sources are, and you, you're at the intersection of that angle, of those two lines. Right? So that's triangulation. This is trilateration. Trilateration doesn't care about the angles at all. It doesn't care about uh, that stuff. All it cares about is the in intersection of three circles. And if you say, well, what's the difference? Well, here's, here's a difference. Let's say you were doing triangulation. And one of your, sort, one of your beacons is right where you are, uh, Peter. And your other beacon is right where, uh, not Steve, uh, uh, huh? Brian. Brian, sorry, Brian, it's been a while. Uh, so if they're like that, well, see, my, I, I, don't, I don't get very good information. I, I could be here or I could be here. It's almost the same angle. 
So, and, and if the two beacons are collinear, you get no information at all. You don't even know how far you are from the beacons. With trilateration, I would be looking at the, a circle from you and a circle from you. And you can be lined up straight on each other. And uh, I still get perfect information on that. So it's, uh, it's not new. Uh, Apollonius figured this out 2,200 years ago. And it has been used worldwide for 70 years in Loran, the Long Range Navigation System. This is Loran in your backyard or Loran in your living room, but with sound instead of with uh, radio. Uh, so it's not new. And it's not Pothinos' problem. That is the triangulation problem. And they, they make a big point about the fact that if the uh, beacons are lined up, uh, Pothinos is out, I can't figure it out. And that's the way most of the things that do the rotating beacons, they depend on having four or five targets that they hit in order to make sure that they know where they are. This only requires three. And, see, and it's somewhat similar to GPS, but GPS is such a high frequency and so, so many things going on, they have to work about, worry about relativistic issues, and fortunately I don't. But since this is sound, if you use this outdoors, your relativistic issue would be wind. And I'm not talking about wind noise, I'm talking about the fact that the wind moves the sound. See, the wind is the ether for sound. There is no ether for light, but there is for sound. All right, another name for it is multilateralization, hyperbolic localization. So, uh, and there's several papers written on this problem was solved of, of, of uh, did I say this, that uh, Apollonius' problem was to find the points that were tangent to three points, lines, or circles. A, a, a point is just a circle with zero radius, and a line is a circle with infinite radius. So it's, it all, they all can devolve into the same problem. So a lot of people have worked on this for you know hundreds of thousands of years. I put this reference here because this has to do with the opposite kind of problem with triangulation and uh, uh, having a uh, using a Kalman filter to figure out where you are at while the robot is moving. What I've come up with in the way that Loran works is that you have to be stationary or relatively stationary. And you say, well, a ship at sea, well, it's, you know, 30 miles an hour, maybe 20 miles an hour. You know, they're not going 1,000 miles an hour. And you can use Loran on aircraft, but you have to do some filtering on it. So, but this, what I've come up with here, at least now, is intended for the robot to be still. So it has lost its way, or it needs to recalibrate, or it's made some turns. And if you make a lot of turns, you know, you may need to recalibrate. So you stop, and you say, where am I? And you find out exactly where you are within about a half an inch or so. OK, so another approach to this is to use two beacons instead of three. All you need to be able to do is to solve two sets of equations to figure out where you are. One of those sets of equations could be the circles for the Loran style stuff. The other could be relative loudness, the one over R drop off, which would tell you how far you were from the beacons. I thought that would be really cool because I didn't know if anybody had done it. And I, there's a good reason. It's too hard to calibrate that. The, the one over R is only true for a perfect omnidirectional uh, source. Nothing is that perfect. So I abandoned that. Uh, try it. It'd be fun. If somebody comes up with it, I think it'd be really cool. Here's some definitions for you. The three beacons or the three speakers. If you, and you're welcome to look at this. Just don't trip over the wires. It's ugly because it's wires everywhere, but there's just nothing here but wires, really. There's a speaker there. There's a little cheap speaker there. And there's one over there. Those were in pairs. They cost $9 for a pair. And I'm only using one in each pair. So if you, you could build it at home and get by for $5 per speaker, right? So that's the green, the blue things, and then the robot is 59 cent microphone from uh, BEI Micro. Is that the name of the company? Uh, BG. BG Micro. Sorry, BG. I'm sorry that you had to move. What a mess. Uh, and a $14 FM transmitter. So $14.59. This is, and so you could just lay this on the robot you know, or package it a little bit prettier. But anyway, this is representing the robot, and that's the red thing. And it doesn't have to be wireless, but you know, if the robot's going to be untethered, then yeah, it needs to be uh, wireless. You might say, why not use Bluetooth or some other wireless scheme? Why are you using an FM? Well, Bluetooth has uh, like 50, 20 to 50 milliseconds of jitter, which people don't care about when they're on a phone call, but this technique requires sample by sample accuracy. So. It would not work at all. I tried it. I tried it. And I was just really shocked. Like I thought I'd messed up my code. And then I looked at the spec for Bluetooth, what spec that there is. 
And it uh, it's like, oh, they, they allow so much slop and jitter in there that it